Hey everybody, and welcome to WCNC Charlotte's Off the Clock with Carboni podcast. I'm your host, WCNC Charlotte Sports Director Nick Carboni. And every week we dive into a great Charlotte sports story. We've done this for a few months now, it's been great. Last week we had UNC great and current Charlotte Hornet Joel Berry II on. We started with uh, our great host of Charlotte today, Eugene Robinson, of course, a former NFL safety and Super Bowl champion. We dove into NASCAR a few weeks ago, Brad Kozlowski, Doug Rice were on the show, so it's been fantastic. And a reminder uh, to follow or subscribe to us when you see us or listen to us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or however you are seeing or listening to us. And you can watch me every weeknight at 6 and 11, and obviously after Sunday Night Football these days on WCNC Charlotte. Got a good one this weekend with the Cardinals and Seahawks being moved into that slot. And we have a good podcast for you this week. It is Robert Woodard, a Charlotte native, UNC baseball great, who has now returned home to coach his Charlotte 49ers. Talked a lot about how they're kind of overcoming the adversity of a short season last spring, and they had some momentum there to a really expanded roster this year with the eligibility rules and, and guys being able to stick around to play that senior season next spring. And also a lot about how he has infused technology into his coaching with the 49ers. Pretty fascinating stuff. And of course, we got back into the UNC days, uh, walking in the door with other top pitching recruits, Daniel Bard and Andrew Miller going to the College World Series, being drafted by the Padres and all of that. So enjoy our conversation with Robert Woodard. All right, Coach, we start off the clock, on the clock, with three quick questions. First one, what's the show you binge-watched the last six months? Oof. Uh, That's a good question. Binge-watched? Um... I don't know, probably probably just MLB since there was such a hiatus for so long. Uh, I, I feel like every time there's an MLB game on, I just try to watch as much as I can. I know that's boring, but when the season got cut off in, in April and May and June, it picked back up in July. It's pretty much, it's pretty much, I just try to watch as much as I can. Yeah, I got to cram it all in now. Favorite baseball player of all time? Wow. Um, growing up, I always wanted to be like Dave Justice. Yep. Uh, which, which being a pitcher, that probably makes sense. Um, but I mean, I just thought he was an awesome player, upright stance, high tops, one batting glove, uh, just a really dynamic player. Probably my favorite pitcher though was Greg Maddox. I was my family. We were big Braves fans growing up. All right. I'll, I'll give you some time to warm up, but current major league hitter you would love to pitch against. Current major league hitter. I would love to pitch against probably, uh, Probably any pitcher in the National League, I guess, when they come up in, in the eight or the nine <laughs> level. Uh, There's a DH you know, now, though, so you don't get that benefit. Well, this yeah, year, anyway. Yeah, yeah, and, and COVID, with COVID rules. But uh, I don't know. I mean, I mean, Freddie Freeman, I'm staying with the Braves. But, I mean, geez, it's hard to overlook what Corey Seager, uh, yeah. what kind of a local product is doing um, on that stage. And – I mean, Mike Trout, one of the greatest players of all time. Uh, Albert Pujols, one of the greatest players of all hitters of all time. I mean, there's a ton of them. I mean, it's. I mean, what's going on in the big leagues right now is, uh, you know, the game's never been at a higher level. There's a ton of them. So uh, you've got the nice office now overlooking the field. So how is it going for you guys on the field this fall? You guys are scrimmaging a lot, and are you going to do the fall World Series? Um, so we will, we've been scrimmaging, um, as much as possible. We've tried to keep things as normal as possible. Obviously there's protocols and, and different things we've had to be, keep in place and our player, our team's tested each and every week. Uh, so we've, you know, we've had to work really hard as a program, just, um, following all the guidelines that the university and the CDC, you know, tell us to adhere to. And, and once we, you know, we pass our COVID tests, uh, you know, we pretty much try to mimic MLB baseball in terms of our distancing and our, our ground rules. Uh, to keep everybody as safe as possible. And we've, we've scrimmaged um, 19 times so far this fall over the course of the last five to six weeks. So um, today is our 20th scrimmage of the fall. Uh, we've, we've, um, so this will it'll wrap up our scrimmages for this week. And then next week will be our final week of the fall. We'll have our fall World, fall World Series, which will be a lot of fun. We'll have the guys draft two teams on Sunday and we'll play a best of five series. We'll play five five scrimmages games regardless in the series, but it will go Monday through 
Saturday with uh, Thursday being kind of a split practice day or, or a rain day if, if it does, which it looks like it might rain a little bit more next week than this week. So you guys had uh, a nice finish to your shortened season, I guess, this spring. Uh, you had a you know a nice home winning streak, and then you win, I believe, on the road at NC State, or was at home? I mean, they were ranked tenth. So what was it? You know, do you, do you take from that that it was tough to stop with so much momentum, um, or do you kind of just build on the positives? Or I, I guess a little bit of both from the spring. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, definitely, we definitely felt like we were starting to come come into our own as a team, and you know, going up to Raleigh and playing a top ten opponent. Uh, you know, at the Doak, I mean, that's that's one of the toughest environments to play in in our region and always a really, really good team. So, uh, yeah, our guys got up early. I think we, we went up five, uh, five, nothing pretty early. And then our bullpen, you know, kept, you know, kept us ahead the rest of the way. And we were able to plot a win and have a good bus ride home there on Tuesday, March 10th, before our season was canceled. And, um, you know, I think all coaches and all sports will remember that phase of our coaching careers in terms of just the conversations and things that we had to have, um, you know, with two, where two days later, I'm, you know, I'm having to tell our team at practice and meet at home plate that the College World Series is canceled. So, um, you know, certainly felt like we were coming into our own. Um, that's, you know, those types of wins are, are really hard to come by um, no matter, no matter the, the time of year. And so when you have a win like that, it certainly builds confidence going, you know, moving forward. So um, for that team, unfortunately, that was that was it. But it certainly built confidence in terms of the returners that we have and the guys coming in that were capable of going into that environment and, and coming out on top. So what does this do for the roster for you guys next spring? I mean, do you have some guys that are sticking around and how do you kind of balance all that out? Yeah, I think I think college baseball in general right now is probably more crowded than ever, but also more talented than ever. Um, you know, so this this tip in a in a typical year we have our roster capped at thirty five players, and uh, this this fall we have forty seven players. Wow. And, and I think if you call around to most Division one schools, you're gonna have you're gonna most schools are gonna have in the forties somewhere. Um, there's schools around the country that have in the fifties. And I know a couple in the sixties, I mean, honestly, so it's, um, it's just, it's just kind of our new normal, I guess, is the phrase of 2020. And you just, you know, it's, but we have a, no matter the roster size, we have an awesome group of guys that have been really, really competitive. Uh, we have 20, 26 pitchers and 21 position players. So as you can imagine, Coach Stott and I work with the pitchers. We're in the bullpen a lot, and BP rounds can go a little bit longer than normal. But, um, you know, it's every day on the field is, is a lot of fun. And um, we've just enjoyed being around this new team, and, and we're really excited to, um, to finish out our fall here with our Fall World Series next week and get into our, you know, our heavier training phase in November and December and January. And get cranked up for what hopefully will be a more normal 2021 season. We'll circle back to everything you're doing with the 49ers in a few minutes. Um, when you were growing up in Charlotte, what was your journey like to get to be a pitcher? Because some people, they want the ball when they're like, as soon as T-ball ends and, and coach pitch ends, they want the ball and some people have to grow into it. So what was that journey like for you? Yeah, these are great questions. Um, so I remember I, I first, I always, I always wanted to pitch, but I didn't know how until I got, and then I was eight years old. And one of my uh, coach pitch coaches said, anybody that wants to learn how to pitch, stay after practice, I'll teach you. And my first lesson, I think I stood on my right leg on like balanced for like 10 minutes straight. Like it was just like, if you can balance on one leg then you can pitch. And that was my first intro to pitching. And um, then I think just kind of natural selection, I think, uh, I was fortunate. I could sort of always, I wasn't always a hard thrower, um, but I could always throw strikes. So I think all parents, they just want the eight year old who can throw strikes to pitch as much as possible to keep the game moving. So I got to pitch a lot. And, um, you know, and as I got older, I still played other positions and I loved hitting. I loved playing shortstop. And I, I did so at the high school level and travel ball level, but it was pretty clear to me when I, I went to my first college prospect camp as a seventh grader yeah. and I'm running like my first 60 yard dash and I'm the slowest kid in camp by a lot. And, uh, you know, there's these guys that are trying to play college shortstop that are running six foot or six, six point six, six point seven, six point five, sixty 60 yard dashes. And I'm three seconds slower than them. 
you know, I think the coach said to me, Hey, you know, I know you play, I know you pitch and hit, but you probably want to, you probably want to make your way to the mound as you get older. So I took that advice. Yeah, it was uh, good advice and good for you for heeding that advice. Great, you know, prep career at Myers Park. Uh, you go to Carolina and you walk in the door with Daniel Bard and Andrew Miller. I mean, I, I can't think of a much better pitching class to come to Carolina with. Was that fun for you? Was that intimidating, motivating? I mean, obviously, you knew Bard from here in Charlotte, but what was that experience like to, you know, be with two other top dogs on the mound right away? Sure. Well, you know, both my parents went went to UNC, so um, I think like any kid, no matter what school your parents go to, when both your parents go to a school, you, you're you going to naturally grow up uh, having an, an affinity for that school. And so when I had the opportunity I, to go to Carolina, I had, it was the smallest scholarship offer of any school uh, that I had, but it's just where I wanted to be. Um, but I also told myself that if, uh, you know, I, w- I wanted to go be around uh, the best of the best and swim and swim in the deep end of the talent pool. And if, because I always looked at it, like if, if I'm, if I'm on the same staff with Andrew Miller and Daniel Bard and I don't pitch, then that means I'm probably not going to pitch in the big leagues because I, because those are the best, those are the best of the best. But if I can, if I can compete with those guys and I can find a way to pitch, you know, along with those guys, then that means I'm doing something well, or that, that means that I'm improving or, or getting better, which is, you know, and then I can compete. And so I didn't, I didn't want, I, I always wanted to kind of be in that environment. I think that that's, that's something that's always brought the best out of myself. And I've always really wanted to, you know, embrace challenges and, and that sort of thing. So I always tell people, I mean, on top of being, you know, two of the most talented pitchers I've ever been around in Miller and Bard, and, you know, they're better people and, you know, I just, I believe that, I do believe that iron sharpens iron. And when you're around it, it makes you better. Do you still talk to Bard? Because I mean, what a, what an amazing comeback story. Seven years out of the big leagues and he comes back with the Rockies, six saves in a shortened season and wins comeback player of the year. I mean, what, what was, just, just while we're talking about him, what was your, what were your interactions with him while he was away from the game? Yeah. I mean, we stay in good touch. I mean, obviously we grew up in Charlotte together. We played, uh, down, down the street at the on deck goes facility for four years together and on the same travel team. And then we were college roommates. So we stay in, we stay in really good touch. And, um, you know, there's been kind of checkpoints along the way, I think for, for Daniel, like it was got up to the big leagues in 09 and could, you know, was just super successful all the way through 11. And then, you know, you saw, he, he, he went into that starter role and, and you saw, you know, things kind of change for him and, and, um, you know, when he, when he left the game in 13 or 14 as a major league player, um, he, you know, he was still signing minor league contracts and he was still training. And every time I was around him, I mean, whether I was you know, pitching coach at UNC from 2016 to 19, he would still come back and, and throw and be around, you know, be around us. And I mean, every time he threw, I still never saw, saw him throw a fastball under 94. <laughs> so like, I mean, it, it, it was always in terms of the stuff and the talent, it never left him. And um, it's just an incredible story uh, of perseverance and resilience because, um, I mean, I'll just say, I know I got released as a 24 year old. Um, and the first time I got released, I started, I jumped into coaching. Like I just said, yeah. if, you know, if the Padres don't want me in their organization, then, you know, then I'm just going to take this as a sign to go, to go coach. And I mean, Daniel got released a few times and he had numerous articles written about how he had lost it and, you know, was never going to get it back. And it was a sad story and da, 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 da. And I mean, I can't, if you can find another person on the planet that had to deal with that exact, you know, those similar type of, um, you know, articles and, and the you know, story to, to come back and, and pitch at the big league level and have that level of success and overcome that. I mean, you know, it's one of the most mentally tough and resilient stories I've ever seen. So, you know, and as his friend, I'm just really, really proud of him. Um, and, you know, to the, to the big, I mean, he's in, you know, he's, we still have group chats with former mm-hmm. teammates and we're all in it together. And, and, um, we used to, you know, we used to all take more vac- like annual vacations. And as everybody started, you know, have, starting their own families and stuff, that kind of, we got away from that, but we're all really close. And I would say that anybody that knows Daniel really closely, um, 
I don't want to say we're, we weren't surprised because you can never predict yeah. this type of a story, but you know, he's such a, he's such a rare talent and he's such a special person just in terms of his makeup and, and competitiveness and drive that, you know, we're, we're kind of not surprised, like, you know, but we're all just really proud of him. So, um, you know, and then you, 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 you go to the, the next level and his wife, Adair, you know, she's, she's been a rock for him. And I mean, you know, he's had a great support network around him and, now he's got three little ones that never got to see him pitch in the big yeah. leagues in you know, 2009 to 11. And now he's got three little ones that, that get to watch him pitch in the big leagues. And they're, you know, so they're, they're, they're getting to see, you know, DB is, you know, as the pitcher and not, not the, not the dad and coach that, you know, they, they first did. That's a great point. <clears throat> um, back to your days at Carolina, still the all-time winning as pitcher. And I don't think you ever lost at home. You came in, you know, obviously as a big part of a recruiting class and you leave, you know, probably even stronger as a pitcher. How did pitching there change you as a pitcher? Yeah, I mean, when you bring that, when you bring up that stuff, I mean, I was just always, like I said, I grew, I grew up loving that, that university and I grew up always wanting to play for that team. So every time I was given the ball, I was going to pitch like my life depended on it um, because I just, I wanted to be there so bad. And if, and if any team was, you know, that I was competing against, they weren't, they weren't trying to beat, you know, me or even our team, they were trying to beat the school that I loved. And so I think that helped me kind of get to another competitive level uh, internally. And, you know, I just think that uh, when you bring up, when you bring up, didn't lose a home game, uh, it makes me think of all the games I should have lost. Cause there's, there's definitely, a, there's definitely a good number of them. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can think of two off the top of my head where 0-2, two outs. We were down a run in the ninth, 0-2, two outs, two strikes against Florida State. And Buster Plosey was playing shortstop, and he kicked a ground ball. And then, um, you know, another infielder kicked a ground ball, and then we hit a fly ball in the infield that should have been caught, and it got dropped, and the run scored to tie it. I mean, should never have won that game. So not only did I not lose that game, uh, you know, I ended up getting a win for that game. And then South Carolina, last game I ever pitched at home in a super regional, we were, um, I gave up a grand slam in like the fifth or sixth inning to go down six to two or six to one. And our offense came back in the next, the next inning and scored eight runs. And, you know, it's just, so I'm, when you say that, I think about, I think about, I think about all the luck and all, all the times my, my teammates picked me up because, you know, that's a, that's just, that type of stuff's really a credit to, you know, the whole, everybody I got to be around. So you grew up as a kid, obviously loving Carolina, going to Carolina. And then you, when you look back at those, those college world series appearances and, and those years of success you guys had and what it did for Tar Heels baseball, you know, what are your, what are your takeaways from that time and, and that period in your life? Just special. Um, you know, I, I think, I just want my, I just wanted to go to go to my parents' alma mater and my you know the school that I grew up loving um, and contribute you know and just to be able to say I, th I think one of the best things you, any high school player I would say out there or junior college player out there that if I could give you one piece of advice of how to approach going to you know coming to Charlotte or whatever school it is just have the goal of going to a program and wh whatever state that program is trying to when you when you leave it try to have made it a better place. And that's all I try. That's all I, you know, so that feeling for me of knowing that that program hadn't been to the college world series, I think since 1990 yeah. and, and going there, you know, and for four years and after, you know, I'll say our, you know, cause that our whole recruiting class in 03 was the number one recruiting class in the country. And I certainly wasn't written about much in that recruiting class, which was fine uh, compared to all the other guys, but it, you know, we left there in 06 when Miller Bard were first rounders, um, losing, you know, one game short of a national title and then 07, two games short of a national title, you know, both to Oregon State. So, you know, you just you just want to go somewhere, wherever that is, uh, be passionate about it and leave it in a better place than, you know, when you got there. And, you know, that's that's something that gives me great, um, you know, great peace of mind.
great stuff so far with Coach. So we're going to move back to his coaching with the 49ers right now. He was the pitching coach with North Carolina and Coach Fox, which was a job he absolutely loved for obvious reasons. I wasn't sure that, you know, Coach Lauren Hibbs was ever going to leave Charlotte. He'd been here for 27 years. But lo and behold, he retired. He went to work for the athletics department at Wichita State where he had ties and Robert Woodard came home. So here's the rest of our conversation. Before we get back to your, your um, coaching with Charlotte, you kind of touched on it earlier. How did that experience as a professional baseball player in any way shape how you coach or, you know, form how you approach a player that has aspirations of getting to that level and getting beyond that level? Well, I mean, you, you see and you see and experience a lot of different things. You know, you're, you're playing for, for the first time. I was playing with players from other countries who came from other cultures. I was playing. Uh, I was I mean, I wasn't taking we weren't staying at Marriott's and, and taking really nice plane rides. We, you know, we were taking 12 hour bus ride. We would play a game at seven and then our bus would leave at midnight in Eugene, Oregon to take a 10 hour bus ride to Boise, Idaho or 12 hour bus ride to Vancouver, Canada. And then we would play that night. Um, yeah. For the first time in my career as a minor league player, I was on a disabled list. So I was, you know, I, I, um, I think I, I strained a, you know, a quad muscle one time and I was on the disabled list for a few weeks and, and then another time and then eventually my shoulder, um, you know, so I, it, it certainly taught me a lot about patience and the rehab process and, and managing players that are here uh, in our program that, you know, have to deal with certain adversities on, on that side because, um, you know, college for four years, college was, um, was part of teams that had a, a good amount of success and, and I would never, I don't, recall ever missing a start because of an injury. Um, you know, so the, the minor league, you know, the minor leagues just taught me a lot and you got to really see the game at the highest levels. I mean, you're, you're, you're playing against guys that are going to be playing the big leagues for a long time. And, um, you know, so it just, it, it's, it, but it also taught me too to not be in too much of a hurry to get there. I think guys at times that, you know, in the college and high school ranks are so anxious to get to, you know, play professional baseball. And that's such a goal. Um, I always, I always try to coach guys into um, it's cliche to be where your feet are, but enjoy the time. There's guys that are, they're going to play professional baseball eventually, you know, just try to make the most of your time wherever you are um, at the amateur level before you get there. Because, you know, the level, one of the worst things you can do is look back and say that you didn't enjoy your time in college, you know, once you get to professional baseball. So he's, you know, coached mainly in the Carolinas here, or, you know, Virginia and, and this area. So you had head coaching aspirations, I'm sure. You're from Charlotte. So when uh, Coach Hibbs retires, like, is that an immediate thought of, well, could I, could I go for that job? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say yes, just from the standpoint that Charlotte was always home for me and my parents still live here. Um, you know, it, it was something that until the news broke that coach Hibbs had decided to, to retire and, and go back to his <clears throat> alma mater at Wichita state is something I really hadn't given, given much thought because at the time I was currently, I had my dream pitching coach job. Yeah. You, know, I, you know, I had my dream. I don't think there's a better, um, you know, I, I, for me, I, there wasn't a better pitching job in the country than at my alma mater. So I was extremely happy where I was. And um, like I said, like you said, I certainly had aspirations to be a head coach, but um, Scott Jackson, the now head coach at Liberty told me a long time when I was a volunteer assistant at 25, he said, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're constantly thinking about the, the next job, you're probably not doing as good of a job yeah. where you currently are. So that always stuck with me throughout my coaching career at, you know, as a volunteer in the UNC Wilmington and Virginia tech and, um, it was honestly just like I had blinders on and, and then all of a sudden, you know, I mean, Coach Hibbs was here for 27 years and um, I, I mean, I, I think he was such a staple in the city of Charlotte and college baseball that you don't even really give it much thought. It's kind of like you think you think that he's going to be here forever and, um, you know, it really never crossed my mind that I would have the opportunity to, you know, to coach college baseball in my hometown, but um as soon as that hit, yeah, I mean, you start to think. You start to think what if, and you start to think about um, how neat that would be and, and how special that would be, um, you know, and then for it to all play out with, you know, 
and getting getting to speak with Mike and getting to know him and, and Darren and then Chris Fuller and the administration here. And then you start learning about them, you know, the momentum that's already in place with with Will being here before me and, and um, you know, Coach Sanchez and, and others. Um, it just became just even more of a no brainer you know, when the opportunity presents itself. And then to, to, to just really, you know, sweeten the pot that much more, I get to coach with four of my really close friends. Uh, we, you know, with B-Rob, um, his number's retired here and he's an All-American here. And he and I go back to, um, you know, we both have strong Mike Schill connection with On Deck mm-hmm. and, and Ty's there, who's now the manager of the St. Louis Cardinal and the Cardinals. And then our recruiting coordinator, Toby Bignall, he was like a young 23-year-old hustling coach who uh, was, in, was from my high school team. Uh, he was a substitute teacher at Myers Park. So he and I go back to like fall of 2002, spring of 2003. Um, John Stott, our, our volunteer assistant coach, he's he was our bullpen catcher my first year at UNC. So he really helped me get in there and, and you know, um, you know, welcome me and, and, you know, embrace me and connect me with the pitching staff there. So, um you know, he was also a scout with the Cleveland Indians, so he brings great perspective on, you know, the scouting side of things. And then Tyler Simmons, our director of player development, he, his dad is a longtime, um, you know, legendary high school coach here in Charlotte and um, has just done tremendous things with us on the player development side. So it's fun. It's fun coming in here each and every day. And, and honestly, I, I think whenever you take a new job, you have high expectations or hopes for how it's going to go. And I can sit here 15 months after, you know, getting to come back home and, and say that it's honestly better than I ever thought it would be. So, and we just, we're just enjoying each and every day here. Put your own stamp on things with a, with a lot of stuff. Um, and we'll get to some of that in a second, but what, what do you want to see this program be five years from now? You said you got a lot of momentum in the athletics department and in the, in the program. What do you want it to look like? Yeah. I mean, for, I mean, five years from now, I, you know, I want to be, I'd love for us to be in a place where um, the goal is hosting regionals each and every year. And, and the, the fan base in the city of Charlotte is when, when college baseball season starts, um, they're paying attention to what we're doing and, and they're, um, they're coming out to the haze and, um, you know, supporting us. And when we play in the uptown games at, at the truest ballpark, they're, they're coming out strong and, um, you know, seeing us, like I said, hosting regionals, because that, that to us is the key. I mean, obviously everybody in the country wants to play in the College World Series, but in my experience, when you when you can get to a place where you're hosting regionals and you're one of those 16 teams, then, you know, I, I think it's like 70 or 80% of teams that play in the College World Series host regionals. So um, you have, to, which means you have to, you have to do really well throughout your conference season. You have to play a tough non-conference schedule. And, um, you know, you certainly have to have, really talented players and, and a strong program to do that because it's not easy. So, you know, that for us is the goal. Um, but, you know, we're trying to focus on the small steps, um, you know, here in October of 2020 to, to put us in a position to do those things. You have infused technology into your coaching with this team. Um, tell me specifically what you're doing with that and how you think it'll help, help these players going forward. Yeah, so I mean, for us here in Charlotte in the baseball program, we we want to we prioritize player development as much as we possibly can. Um, I'm a firm believer that you know if your players are, are certainly talented and you, and you recruit talent, but then you know you develop them um, as efficiently and, and as aggressively as possible, um, you know, then some neat things can start to happen. And I want players to know that you know, while they're here, that they have all the tools and resources to be successful. The last thing, you know, one, I think, just like, I think parents want to provide for their children. You know, it's like, I think coach, I think player development and coaching is very similar. I think you want to provide for your players. You want them to know that when they, when they walk to the locker room, that they're going to, you know, and they're, they're coming out to the field, that they're going to have every resource possible to be successful. And they're not looking on social media or they're looking at other programs and saying, well, those guys have that and we don't have this. And, um, you know, that's why, you know, I wish I was there or, you know, those guys have an advantage over us because they have those things and we don't have those things. Um, so we've always, you know, from day one as a coaching staff, we've tried to prioritize um, anything and everything that we feel like can benefit our players um, and, and helping them achieve their goals and be the best players they can be. We can, 
um, whether that's, you know, uh, tracking pitching and hitting metrics with Rapsodo or hitting metrics with glass motion sensors on the knobs of the bats um, or purchasing high-speed cameras uh, for, you know, the, seeing the ball come off the fingertips of our pitchers or, I mean, there's a lot of things or just, you know, just a pretty basic fundamental thing of having 4K resolution cameras all throughout our stadium so that every pitch is recorded and our players can see it. Um, you know, just whatever, whatever we can possibly do, we want to, we want to try to provide here. And, um, you know, because we, we just think that's really important. Every player has a, a limited amount of time to achieve his goals. Uh, so we want to try to provide all the resources and tools necessary to achieve those goals. All right. Glad to have Coach back in town. Thank you to him for joining us. Thank you to the Charlotte Athletics Department communications staff for setting that up. Can't wait to see what they do next spring. Can't wait to get, get out there to the field again and, and watch the 49ers play. So thank you for joining us again. Subscribe, follow if you're watching or listening to us. And you can see me this Sunday night after the game on WCNC Charlotte.